Welcome, welcome as always. How good it is to be here. How good it is to be present with each other in loving community and how wonderful it is to be present 
with our God in this holy space. It is so good that we have this opportunity to gather, to be together, to be healthy with one another, to celebrate the life that has been uh, passed to us, this life of abundance that we celebrate. Uh, We have much to give thanks for today, and I hope that you join me not only in giving thanks, but in preparing ourselves for what might come next. So might we be refreshed here, might we be encouraged, and might we be moved to move as the Lord moves as we leave this place. Um, But we won't leave right away because we have have an official board meeting directly following worship. We invite you just to stay seated because certainly as the early church considered their business part of their worship, we should as well. Uh, it, the main t- maintenance of uh, this structure, the maintenance of our faith community is certainly part of our worship. Uh, so we invite you to stick around for our official board meeting. If you're joining us online, there is a, a Zoom link that's available through the praises and prayers that have been sent out. Um, And we invite you to join through that if you are able. Uh, If you need a bulletin, you can join uh, on our website at firstchristianniles.org. And um, you can see that we have a few things going on this week. Uh, In our summer months, things slow down just a little bit. But I will have the opportunity this week to be in uh, Columbus as I serve the adult conference of the Christian Church in Ohio, Disciples of Christ. Uh, So I'll be at camp, but certainly it is an opportunity for work for me. So uh, if anybody has any need to contact me, I'm still fully available. It's just going to be a little bit of a drive if I need to to come back this way. Um, I also, it is worth giving thanks uh, for the music that we have the opportunity to experience over the past few weeks. Um, thank you, Doris, for being present with us, for sharing your gifts, for helping us. Not only has she helped us over the past couple weeks, but uh, she kind of jumped in this week, not having the knowledge that she would be um, playing for us until about midweek. Uh, so, um, and that is because uh, David is uh, down with COVID uh, at the moment. So, um, are there any announcements from the congregation this morning? Carol. Undy Sunday. Okay, so um, as we had the collection for shoes over the past couple weeks, now we are collecting undies. Uh, anywhere from kindergarten through high school, any make, model, size, uh, are, all are acceptable. Well, oh. My brain moves in a, I don't, I gotta. Any other announcements? <laughs> Shelly. I gotta follow that. Yeah. Good morning. I'm um, sorry I missed the last few weeks, last Sundays. Um, this Wednesday, we're having a Bible school work night um, down the fellowship hall from 6 to 8 to get. Um, Prepping for Bible school. Registration forms um, were in the back a couple weeks ago. I do have some flyers if anybody wants to take to post somewhere. I just have to change the date for the pre-registration. Um, originally for July 10th, it's going to be changed to um, July 18th. And that pre-register just confirms that you'll be able to get um, a t-shirt for Bible school. Um, you had gotten my email a few weeks ago. Um, I mentioned how there's been like supply chain issues with this program being this is the second year, very popular. There's like no supplies. But Thursday, I had a visitor, and I would like to introduce you to Beacon or Puffin. He came to us from uh, Southern Ohio on Thursday. So I'm thankful for the church that donated this. Um, later today, I'm heading down to Salem to get our big banner of the map for our decorations. So thankful for Cokesbury's um, Facebook pages. People have been graciously sharing their supplies. Um, any questions, um, come see me. And I'll see you Wednesday. Thank you, Sean. I didn't know puffins were native to Southern Ohio. <laughs> Anything else we need to name this morning? 
I invite us then to center ourselves, to find Christ in our midst, and to worship fully. Might we be present with each other and with the divine. And may we join together in our call to worship. Loving God, you call us to turn away from our own selfish interests, to take up our cross and to follow you, to find our lives. May we live them in service of your mission. Give us open hearts and open hands. Make us eager to hear your voice and seek your guidance. Open our minds to your ever-present spirit that is always moving within and around us. Open our spirits to your nudging and open our lives to your love. May we join together in our opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision. We'll play it once through and then we'll join in for two verses. join together in prayer. First of silent, meditative, individual prayer, naming all that we have to bring to our God, the good and the bad, the hopeful and the hurt, all that we are, all that we have, that God might hear us as God certainly hears our innermost thoughts, our deepest desires, our anguish that we might bring them forth in such a way that we can center ourselves through that which upsets us, which rocks our boat, those storms that we have sailed through this week and the sight of land that brings us hope. In all these things, may God walk with us as we hope to bring answer to prayer. I then invite you to hear the morning prayer, to join together in our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray.
all people and all nations. Creator God of that, of all that, that we see and perceive, that we know to exist. From ourselves and our considered lofty positions in this creation down to those creeping things, those rames that you have breathed life into just as you have given us life. Help us, O oh God, to see the inherent worth of all that we encounter, the goodness of your creation, from the plants that give us oxygen to the animals that give those plants carbon dioxide that we might all breathe as one, that we might breathe in and breathe out as the Spirit has given us breath, as your creative force in this creation, that Holy Spirit, that Agios Numa, has allowed us to breathe in the divine and exhale all that God has commanded us to be has called us and hoped for us to live into. In all the ways that you have revealed yourself, O divine, we give you thanks for commands, for challenges, for covenants, for hopeful messages from your Son, and from the guiding nudges of the Spirit in our midst. For your revealed nature in all of its forms, we give thanks, for in your presence in our lives we find a different way to live, different than just what we might want for ourselves or what the world might call us to. Indeed, for us to be your followers, your Son has called us to take up our cross daily and follow. And though we struggle with what this might mean, and though we struggle with what we fear it means, we struggle with the difficulty of the processes of being a Christian. Help us to maintain a path, O oh God. Give us diligence, strength of mind, and steady hands and hearts that we might follow faithfully that we might do all that is in our power to understand what you are calling us to and not what we perceive you to be calling us to. Might we find truth in a world where truth is so hard to find? Might we see truth? Might we embrace it? Might we be so close to it that we know at all times that it is founded and guided by your wisdom? that the wisdom of the divine might be our guide and our hope. Allow us to live into it such a way that those around us perceive a change in our countenance, that we might be transfigured as your Son has been transfigured, and that we might know through your Son we find life and life abundant. Might we not be ashamed, but might we be so proud in the glory that you share with this creation that we can't help but keep it to ourselves and it overflows from us out of this building and into the world. Might others find the kingdom that your son has taught us about and might they find it by our lives, O oh God. So might we live in such a way that we bring glory and honor to you. Might we live in such a way that we fulfill your teachings and live into your commands and covenant. In all these things, might we be those who take up our cross. Might we start with the words of your Son, who has taught us to pray, saying together in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
I invite us to hear our scripture reading for this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 18 through 27. Once, when Jesus was praying alone, with only the disciples near him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Messiah of God. He sternly ordered and commanded them not to tell anyone, saying, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Then he said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. May God add a blessing to this and every reading from God's holy word. I invite you again into an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, might we be filled with your presence this morning. Might we discard ourselves in whatever way we are able to, in whatever way you call us to, that we might be filled with your presence and not our own desires, our own hopes, our own fears. Might we discard them in a way that is healthy to our mind and body and spirit and healthy to the kingdom of God. Might we embody your grace and your presence in our lives that all might know you, O God. And might it start here, so that all that we think, all that we say, all that we act upon might bring you glory and honor, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. I was working on my Shakespeare. That wasn't that great. That wasn't that great. I could do Macbeth just a little bit better, but this is one of Shakespeare's favorite and best-known lines. The king spoke the line in Act 5 of the play Richard III after losing his horse in battle. More generally, the meaning of the expression is that the speaker is in great need of a particular item and is willing to trade something of great value to get it. The quotation is sometimes now repeatedly used ironically when someone is in need of something silly, nonsensical, unimportant. My kingdom for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee in my case, a warm coat, whatever. We use phrases that have grand importance and we trivialize them. I hear the same thing used in such a way when we talk about taking up our cross. Well, that's just my cross to bear is such an overused idiom because it's usually used in the same way that this phrase from Shakespeare is used. It's usually used in such a way when um, we're being slightly annoyed by someone else. I hear parents use it a lot in relation to their kids. Kids do something silly in front of everybody in the church, and they say, oh, that's just my cross to bear, and everybody kind of chuckles. What does it mean to take up our cross, to take it up daily? This is a difficult scripture, probably one that we're all familiar with, um, usually chunked up in different ways. Uh, If you've heard it in a sermon, you've probably heard smaller portions than the entirety that we use today. 
But we hear a distinctive command to take up our cross and daily follow. We know that it's important because this exact um, whole chunk of, of script, Scripture excuse me, is found in all three synoptic Gospels. It's found, if, if the general consensus among scholars today is that Mark was the first gospel written, uh, Matthew and Luke looked to Mark as a source. Generally why Mark is shorter, you know, when you write a book report, the book report has to be longer than the book for some reason, right? So Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source. Mark is succinct where Matthew and Luke tend to uh, elaborate uh, in, in, in more eloquence, especially Luke. But they used this exact same, Matthew and Luke used this exact same chunk uh, across the gospel. Specifically, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves. Transcribed directly from Mark into Matthew and Luke. Now, I would get in trouble if I did that for a class. Matthew and Luke got away with it. But it tells us that it's very, very important. If they lifted an entire paragraph word for word and added it into their gospel then it must have some profound importance to the audience to whom they were writing. It, and also it's important to note that not only is this verbatim in all three Gospels, but it all follows, even though they're found in different chapters and in different places in the narrative of each Gospel, it directly follows this messianic um, confession by Peter. Peter, who in each gospel can't figure out even the slightest directions from Jesus. Peter, whose name is the rock, not only because he's the foundation upon which the church was built, but also because the way he acts in the gospels. He never seems to get it. He just can't figure out what Jesus is telling him. But he is the first one in the scriptures to name who Jesus is. That Jesus is the Messiah. And Mark immediately tells him not to tell anybody else for some reason. We have different authors and handle it in different ways. Our reading for today, you hear the same thing earlier uh, in, in Luke that he tells him not to tell anybody else. So just the disciples are here with Jesus. And the disciples now from this point on in each gospel should understand who Christ is because Peter made this messianic confession. Some folks think you're Elijah. Some folks think you're one of the other prophets. Some Moses returned, but we know you to be the Messiah, the one foretold, the anointed one of God. It must be important then that if we understand as the readers of Matthew and Mark and Luke, now who Jesus is, if we have this confession of, of who the Messiah is, and this is midway in the Gospels, just about, uh, it's, early, it's later in Mark, it's, it's earlier in Matthew and Luke, um, but we now know for certain who Jesus was. If this is your first time reading a Gospel, I'm sorry to spoil this for you. Spoiler alert, right? Jesus is the Messiah. The anointed one of God. Now this means some very specific things. And if you've been to church ever, you should know a little bit of that. But we can explain a little bit more about what it means in this particular place. He is the Messiah, the anointed one. The one called by God to reestablish the Davidic kingdom in whatever form it ended up taking. And though the disciples uh, un misunderstood what the Davidic kingdom would look like, and though we still misunderstand what the Davidic kingdom looks like, what the kingdom of God looks like, here we have an explanation of Christ about what it means to be a part of the kingdom. We hear directly after that messianic confession that for us, the, the, the readers, the, the audience, and vicariously then us, that we, to be followers, to be followers of the Christ, if anyone to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This is a prerequisite for being a Christian. 
This isn't something we ever ask at baptisms, is it? Have you taken up your cross? Have you brought your cross with you today? Did anybody bring their cross? Uh, jewelry doesn't count. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's on your purse, in your Bible. What does this mean? None of us. You don't know Christians because they, they, you know, have a cross in their pickup. You don't know Christians because they're walking down the sidewalk with their cross. So what does it mean? I actually was going to bring a cross up here this morning from downstairs, and I couldn't even do that. That was too much of a problem for me to bring it up the stairs, let alone to carry it with me every day and deny myself. So what does it mean to take up our cross and to follow, especially... If life and death is in the balance, if the nature of an authentic Christian is on the line, maybe we can talk first about what it isn't. Sometimes we talk about our own struggles uh, during, I, I hear it a lot during Lent. I gave up wine and chocolate for Lent this year. It's just my cross to bear. Y'all. <laughs> We, all should, we shouldn't hear this as minor inconveniences. We shouldn't hear this as something small that we're setting aside. We shouldn't hear this trivialized in a way that says, oh, my kids are being rambunctious today. That's just my cross to bear. We also shouldn't hear it as a glorification of suffering. There's a difficult balance in here because there is some suffering that comes with picking up your cross. Suffering, discomfort, denial of self. That is part of it. But we shouldn't hear it as a glorification of suffering. Especially when we're talking about other people. When we see someone struggling to live faithfully. When we see someone hurting because of faith. When we see that people are uh, hurting themselves because of their faith. It's not something we should glorify. We shouldn't say that they are taking up their cross and lauding that. There are certainly more ways that the improper use of this metaphor turns the good news into bad news. I've heard preachers tell folks to stay in bad or abusive relationships, to endure racial oppression as a way of bearing a cross. At some point in time in America, slavery was used as an ex it, it, bearing your cross was used as an excuse for the suffering of slaves. We should be suspicious of any rhetoric which places the cross on the shoulders of another. We're called to take up our own cross and not nail others to them. There's another important aspect to remember about suffering and, and Christ's call to take up a cross. Even Christ didn't bear his cross alone. Simon of Cyrene helped him out. When Christ carried the cross, Simon of Cyrene bore it with him. There's a sense in which whatever metaphorical cross we take up, there should be others, a community of support to carry it with us in solidarity. The natural response to anyone who tells you to bear a cross should be, then will you carry it with me? The answer is no thanks. We question motives. And we question what cross we're bearing. Now there's a couple issues with the way we read this that should give us some insight. Exegesis here. Just a little bit of meatball exegesis in your sermon. Uh, this is something I usually do behind the scenes and then give you the information. But I, I want you to share with me part of this process, right? So there's three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that each have this specific text. Uh, each of them are trying to promote a, a, a image of the divine that makes sense to those hearing. And it must be more universal. There must be some overarching truth because this is contained in each three, uh, three Gospels in the exact same way and after this Messianic proclamation. Uh, so we have to consider this is where you need to have your own opinion. I'm sorry to do this to you on a Sunday morning. 
but you have to consider the nature of what you think the Bible is. What's your biblical authority, right? How do you read Scripture? Is it something that was passed down letter by letter by lightning and rock? Is it, is it fully transcribed by God? Or is it people writing about their concepts of God? Chances are we're all somewhere in the middle. We would all probably say that Scripture is divinely inspired. But what that means to each of us is going to be different, especially because we're disciples. If we sat down and talked about it, we would find wonderful nuance to be celebrated within each of the members of our congregation and community. But we have to consider then, um, each of the synoptic gospels have a different path that Jesus took throughout Jesus' life. And it's not to say that they're contradicting one another. It's not to say that this can't be harmonized in some way. But it does say that the gospel authors in some way had an agenda with, to which they were writing. That makes sense. Have you ever written anything and didn't have a, a point to the writing? Unless, even journaling, right? Even journaling, you're trying to log what happened during your day. No one writes with no point in writing. You can as an exercise in writing, but it's not a gospel. No offense to your writing. So the Gospels then had an agenda of what they were trying to do. They were trying to evangelize, explain who Christ was to anybody who would read this. To do that, they formatted the life of Jesus in such a way that it is easily understandable. That's why you get slight discrepancies about where Jesus was at what time compared to different Gospel authors. We have to consider then what the Gospel authors were trying to tell us in this writing. We have to consider what the gospel authors were saying to the original audience and what they're saying to us. And I run into an issue, uh, I, I bring this up because one of the main issues that we run into is, is Jesus tells his disciples to take up their cross. And we hear that differently because we're 2,000 years removed from the story. We hear that differently because we know what happened on Holy Week. We know how Jesus died, and we know how Jesus lived. But if this is a recording of a story that happened to Jesus before he was crucified, the disciples probably didn't have any idea that he would be crucified, right? Does that make sense? It happened before the event. So we take a look at it, and, and we even see if we can look at Scripture, and it says, it, it does say, Jesus even lets Peter know, lets the disciples know, look, things aren't going to go the way you think they are. I'm going to go undergo suffering. I'm going to die. This is something that's going to happen. He doesn't mention a cross here, though. He doesn't mention a cross. He just says that he's going to be killed. He's going to, uh, it's going to be a, a painful, a bad death. So when Jesus says, take up your cross, we think, oh, like Jesus did when he was crucified. The disciples don't have that understanding because he has yet to be crucified. This is where your biblical authority comes in. There's a chance that the author who's writing after the death and resurrection of Christ knows the story, right? If you're writing a bibliography, you've got to know what you're writing about. Uh, and then that's what he's, he's doing. He's writing, the gospel authors are writing about the nature of Christ. When he says, take up your cross, if Jesus said this the way that it happened, it's a super challenging message. If, Jesus is, if this is recorded accurately by the gospel authors, this is a challenging message to the disciples. Because the only people that died on crosses were criminals of the state. They were folks that went up against the empire. It was death for political dissidents. So if Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow me, he's calling all of them to be political dissidents. That's not something we hear, is it? We don't like to make waves in church. That's why church folk are, are pretty easygoing. We only get nervous when someone sits in our pew, right? Like, we're easygoing folks. We don't like making waves. But if we read this in this way, if this is our interpretation, that Christ is calling the disciples to take up their cross before Christ was crucified, he's calling them to martyrdom. He's calling them to martyrdom. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, his first followers probably didn't hear it metaphorically. Crucifixion was reserved for enemies of the state, so Jesus' summons would have been heard as a call to insurrection. 
They knew that would-be messiahs and revolutionaries who proclaimed a new imminent kingdom of God had said, take up your sword and follow me. Some of these rebellions led to huge mass executions by crucifixion. So when Jesus says, take up your cross, he's skipping steps. He calls his followers to do the kinds of swordless, nonviolent things that would lead to martyrdom. Stephen, James, Paul all answered that call and died. And you can read more about their stories in the book of Acts. Take up your cross and follow me is a play on the metaphor, the idiom of take up your sword and follow me. But instead of following in arms, it's following in nonviolent, nonviolent revolutionary action, the kind that would invite persecution. And knowing, us knowing how the story of Jesus plays out, that's exactly what happened, isn't it? Jesus, a nonviolent person, who says, lay down your sword and your shield, ends up dying as a political prisoner, though he was nonviolent, except for maybe turning the tables in the temple. And that might have been enough to do it. But it wasn't a sword. That was a protest. Taking up our cross is a call to lay down our lives. Not just metaphorically, not just figuratively. Taking up our cross daily means we are setting aside our basic selves for the glory of the kingdom of God. Not for the kingdom of men or any other empire or the rules that they have, but for the kingdom of God. I hesitate to even say that we're called to be insurrectionists because we experience insurrection and we know that it is not a good thing. But I believe that a true Christian insurrection would look peaceful. It might end in our own lives ending, but it would be peaceful. Bravery and a willingness to suffer itself is not the measure of what makes a cross. When Christians claim they are being persecuted, we need to ask critical questions about who is placing a burden on whom and who is asking whom to endure suffering and for what end. Remember, we are called to pick up our own cross and not to nail others to it. The cross of Christ and the call to take up our own instead of taking up arms, instead of taking up arms, should not be stripped of its scandal and offensiveness to the world and to the empire. It's a call to change the order of things with our vulnerability instead of the power of a sword. With love rather than coercion. We take up a cross instead of a sword because the world is heavily invested in inequality in patriarchy, in the coercive use of force, in the fear of suffering and death. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. But those who die by their cross live for God. Amen. I'm not sure I'm any closer to picking up my own cross. I can start to understand what it means, but to live into it, what a struggle. A daily struggle, a minute by minute, moment by moment struggle to set aside what I want for this world and to embrace what the divine wants. I struggle because sometimes I conflate the two. I hope that what I want is what God wants. And sometimes if I hope enough about what I want being what God wants, I can pretend it's true. Sometimes I can pretend 
that what I want most deeply in this world is what God wishes for me. It's a bit opposite of, well, that's just my cross to bear. It's, well, this is what Jesus wants from me, when it's really not most of the time. Instead, what we are called to do is discern in each moment what God is calling us to do and to set aside all of our hubris, all of our desires, and to live into what God wants for us. The good news is that what God wants for us is always for our own benefit. It's for our own uh, goodness. God has plans for us, not for evil or ill will, but for good. And if we simply follow the Christ in each moment, we will be blessed beyond measure. Here is an opportunity to be reminded of the covenant that God has laid for us that makes it easier to set aside our hubris, to lay down our desires, to lay down our swords, and to pick up our cross. For we remember what comes with bearing a cross. To die to ourselves brings life. This is what we are welcomed into as we gather around this table. Life abundant and life beyond our imagining. Something that Christ has set up for us as Christ is building the kingdom. We get to be co-creators in that kingdom. And this is the food and the drink that gives us the strength and the courage to continue on in building. To carry our crosses across the table. So I hand on to you as it has been handed on to me. That on the night that Jesus last ate with friends and with family with those that would do him harm and violence, with those that would lead directly to his death. And still he broke bread with them. He took a loaf of bread and after having blessed it, he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup and after having blessed it, said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink in remembrance of me. For as often as we gather together, as often as we share bread, as often as we share cup, we proclaim that we are not ourselves, but we are God's. And we lay down our lives and take up our crosses because we know the kingdom is coming, because Christ has proclaimed it. And we will preach these things until Christ comes for us again. Amen. I invite you to take what you have. Bread as Christ's body broken for you and partake. Cup as Christ's blood poured out for us and partake. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, each week we participate in this communion service, remembering that when we share in this bread and this cup, the only thing Jesus asks of us is that we remember him, his words, his life, his ministry, his ultimate sacrifice that we could receive eternal salvation. We're grateful for the gift of your son, and we pray that we never forget the significance of these emblems in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, as we honor and remember the great gift of your son, we ask that you bless these gifts that we bring today. We bring them before you that your love may imbue them with the power to do the good that is so desperately needed in your world. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. May we join together in our closing hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. Again, we'll hear it the first time, and then we'll join together for two verses.
our benediction. May you depart knowing the invitation of God to move from comfort to insecurity, from what we know to what we have yet to discover, from where we have been from to where we have yet to go, from safety to a place of risk. Go in the example of the saints before you, the Israelites in the wilderness, Paul blind in Damascus, waiting for Ananias. Go in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who said, follow me without saying where he was going, just promising transformation and relationship with the triune God along the way. Amen.